So for this season, we're focusing on environmental diversity. And we've done that for a few reasons. We had some feedback from people that people were really keen to hear about um, just all the different diverse ways that our environmental science community uh, are working in this space, so the diversity of um, presenters. We also, um, when we were planning this series, it was around the time, the beginnings of COVID, of Black Lives Matter, and it really, I guess, focused that for us as a community, it's really important to celebrate our diversity of us as a community, as well as ecologically. So we invited um, Professor Sean Connell to address this question of diversity. What does diversity mean? Why is it important in, um, in um, ecological sense? So um, Sean is going to be presenting soon. And then later in the series, we're going to have Pam Catchaside finishing our series, thinking about environmental diversity from the fungal kingdom point of view. So we've really tried to pick up on marine, terrestrial, and across as many kingdoms as possible. So today we're really excited. We have Angus Mitchell and Sean Connell. So I will hand over to, first of all, we'd love to hear from Angus Mitchell, who is um, an exciting PhD student at the beginning of his journey, presenting his proposal for his PhD research. So really early cutting edge science of what's happening in, in Angus's research. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Thank you all for tuning in to the School of Biological Sciences first round of the spring seminar series. So my name is Angus Mitchell and I have the pleasure of bringing you my introductory PhD seminar, which I am looking at the effects of ocean warming and acidification on tropical rain shifting fish and their novel temperate competitors. My supervisors for the project are Professor Ivan Nagelkirken from the University of Adelaide and Professor David Booth from the University of Technology in Sydney. So, ecosystem functionality and species biogeography are be quickly being altered at a global extent through the effects of anthropogenic climate change. Global temperature increases of 0.5 degrees over the past century have instigated both marine and terrestrial organisms to go undergo altitudinal and latitudinal rain shifts with present communities and invaders forced to interact through competition for available resources. Evidence suggests that marine organisms are most affected by rain shifts with marine species moving at a maximum rate of 28.1 kilometers per year. Comparatively, terrestrial organisms are moving at a maximum average rate of 6.1 kilometers per year. Tropical marine organisms are particularly susceptible to poleward rain shifts given their natural, naturally um, narrow thermal niche compared to temperate species where we have a sort of wider fluctuation in um, temperate variability as, and also because temp, uh, water temperature strongly uh, influences the life history strategies and subsequently the fitness of all marine organisms. So looking specifically at tropical organisms, a widening of the tropical belt and climate induced intensification of poleward boundary currents such as the East Australian current the Kuroshio current in Japan and the Gulf Steam current in North America has amplified the dispersal of many uh, tropical organisms, including corals, urchins and fish into cooler regions to either avoid detrimental physiological effects occurred by temperatures closer to their thermal sort of maxima at lower latitudes or to exploit ecosystems at higher latitudes where temperatures have now made these um, regions suitable for invasion. Looking specifically at Australian marine rain shifts, faster than average warming at temperate latitudes about 34 south around Sydney, um, with, in combination with strengthening of the East Australian current on the back of climate change has facilitated the dispersal of over 150 species of tropical fish into temperate waters surrounding Sydney annually. Many of these species arriving are small bodied, dietary generalists and exhibit a bipartite life cycle. Where we can see on the screen here, um, uh, larvae are transported from the core adult population down into um, latitudes around Sydney where they set, settle into rocky reef sort of embayments and habitats. So these species arriving in Sydney are commonly termed vagrants. Vagrant fish are not the only taxa moving forward with some species of coral also migrating into temperate latitudes. And so thus over the past 20 years when the, since surveys on vagrant fish have begun, 
uh, temperate ecosystem dynamics have been changing on multiple different levels. So it's becoming increasingly important to understand resulting interactions between vagrant invaders and the resident species and how the whole environment as a whole is changing. And to further on this, to understand how future climatic stresses might affect temperate marine ecosystem functionality. So one of the most commonly observed species of vagrants is Abadefta fagiensis from the damsel fish family, more commonly known as the Indo-Pacific Sergeant Major. Currently, winter temperatures prevent fagiensis <coughs> from establishing breeding populations with individuals dying off in winter as temperatures drop below their critical um, minimum temperature, so about 16 degrees. However, given temperatures are projected to increase by up to 4.5 degrees based on the RC. 8.5 rating uh, by 2100, the arrival of tropical vagrants will likely increase and water temperature will no longer remain a mitigating barrier to their establishment. More interestingly is that previous surveys on vagrants have identified vagiensis and other sort of dams of fishes, including Sexafaxis and Bangalensis, shoaling with temperate species seen here on the screen. Here, Adipicis scratus, more commonly known as stripey, if I bet you can tell why. Um, and these, uh, Tropicals which shoaled with these temperates have significantly improved growth rate and decreased mortality when they shoaled with the temperates, surviving longer into winter in comparison to the tropical only shoals at temperate latitudes. So such findings sort of are indicative that vagiensis is capable of some degree of behavioral plasticity, meaning the species can alter its behavior in order to reduce its acclimation time to a new environment. And hence, if waters continue to warm, it's been suggested that vagrants will establish and subsequently compete against the temperature in the near future. So past research looking at vagrants has primarily focused on the current temperature effects and thermal minimum effects, failing to assess how future conditions uh, might shift competition and community dynamics. So for my honours project last year, last year and in alignment with um, Manami Suzaki's research as well, another PhD student with Ivan. We assessed how current and future sort of temperature conditions projected for the region would could alter the behavior and physiology in the two sort of target species, one being the tropical invader and one being the temperate resident. Um, so assessment of individual behaviors uh, shown on screen demonstrates that the effect of temperature on both temperate and tropical species is evident across the behavioral proxies I tested for my honors project. So in the picture summary, it demonstrates that high temperatures drove both the temperate and tropical fish to be bolder and more active. But uh, for, for tropicals, it appears small increases in temperature from 20 to 23 degrees likely benefited its growth and survival through increased feeding. Meanwhile, the temperature increase on temperates between 20 and 23 degrees on temperates left behavioral proxies unchanged, suggesting some sort of metabolic resistance to the temperature occurred. However, a rise towards Strugatus' thermal maxima and Vagiensis' sort of thermal optima getting towards its thermal optima at 26 degrees appears to compromise kinetic activity in the temperate, consequently altering the overall behavior of the Strugatus as it requires, it was required to meet a higher metabolic um, rate and therefore it became more active, more bolder and more riskier. By contrast, higher temperatures widen the realized sort of net aerobic scope of vagiensis, benefiting fitness as it was able to increase its frequency of um, important behaviors such as aggression and feeding, and also improve its activity as a whole. Of all biotic factors, changes in water temperature have the largest sort of physiological effect on fish. Given that fish are ectothermic, increases in temperature will drive increases in metabolic rates, as mentioned before. This translates into an increased need to meet consumption and energetic dem uh, demands. Hence, looking at ocean warming specifically is likely to have a strong impact on predator-prey interactions and will affect predator avoidance, encounter rates, capture success, and so forth. Subsequently, increases in temperature within the regions of southeastern Australia, subject to faster than average warming, will likely experience the most shifts in species interactions predator prey dynamics and ecosystem functionality under the warming regimes forecasted for the area. So taking a step back from temperature, we must remember climate change is a multifaceted response and that ecosystem functionality at a multi-stressor level is ever changing and that temperature increases alone are not likely a significant determinant of how ecosystems may change or specifically how vagrant species might adopt, shift or change their behavior and physiology at temperate latitudes in order to establish.
So environmental alteration derived indirectly and directly from climate change um, shifts an array of other abiotic and biotic factors in marine environments, including the salinity, the habitat, the community dynamics functionality, and also the pH. So hence determining how systems may be affected by um, solely focusing on single species, single factors such as temperature response is not necessarily an accurate determinant for forecasting elicited ecosystem responses as a whole. Marine climate research has also identified embayments and estuaries, locations where vagrants settle around Sydney as hotspots for ocean acidification. So hence understanding the interaction effect between CO2 and temperature uh, on, invader, on invaders and uh, temperate residents for my research is important for understanding species interaction effects. So it's well known that pH alters uh, behavioural and neurological responses in fishes with higher CO2 levels altering behavioural responses in marine fish by blocking the GABA A receptor pathway in the brain and also CO2 um, alters and modifies habitat. So we have a change in quality and quantity of uh, items such as food and habitat and thus this indirectly alters activity, boldness and habitat selection behaviours. Interestingly, as seen on the uh, poster on the screen, you can see that CO2 can also affect the detection and olfactory cue responses in marine packs of whereby juveniles or even adults may respond to incorrect cues or fail to pick up cues such as predator cues and alarm cues altogether. Um, What's also interesting is the functionality of CO2 and temperature on behavior. So papers assessing behavior changes specifically in fish and across marine taxa in response to CO2 and temperature have found mixed and varying responses when combining the two factors to test for changes in behavior. So while isolating either factor may have elicited one response in a species, say they become more active under temperature, um, a decrease in pH might induce a less active response or have no response altogether. Meanwhile, when we combine both of these um, variables together, it might induce an entirely different response to when we have these sort of single factor experiments. So the research gaps on vagrants. So previous studies on range shifting vagrants have failed to assess the combined effects of temperature and elevated CO2, primarily focusing on the thermal minimum effects. While another caveat of prior vagrant research is that much of the research solely focuses on individual responses rather than shoaling and paired responses and also interactions with novel temperate competitors. Hence, competition responses between natives and invaders is currently unknown. Given the arrival of vagrants at temperate latitudes is projected to increase on the back of strengthening currents and ocean warming, assessment of how pH uh, projected pH and temperature shifts simultaneously and in isolation of each other affect important traits um, regarding fitness and interactions in tropicals and temperatures. Um, is affected, it's becoming critically important to predicting the competition and biodiversity implications of um, temperate environments and ecosystems uh, surrounding Sydney. So one of the first things a species does when entering a novel environment is change its behaviour. So, my research aims to understand how vagrant, specifically Abadeftus vagiensis, changes its behavior or how its behavior is affected at temperate latitudes. And then also how its behavior is affected by future and also future conditions and also by the interaction effect with novel temperate competitors. In parallel to this, I plan to compare how these behaviors are also affected in temperate, so how Mato is affected by the arrival of vagrants and also how future um, conditions affect the behavior of, of temperance. So following on from this, as behavior is linked with physiology and cognition, I also plan to assess how physiology and cognition shifts in response to these varying conditions and interactions between the two species. So understanding these parameters will allow me to link species interactions and competitive abilities of the temperance and tropical. So to reach these objectives, I plan to collect my data across two rounds of data collection. Year one, in a controlled, confined laboratory experiment testing future conditions, year two being a latitude and field experiment. So for testing future conditions, confined laboratory experiments offer the most realistic approach to assessing how projected ocean acidification and warming waters might affect temperate natives and comparatively the vagrants. Specifically, assessment of vagrant and temperate species interactions at the forefront of range shifting in Southeast Australia under laboratory conditions 
will help us predict how these species might act, interact in the future and offers the best um, option moving forward to do this. So for my first round of data collection, which I took, undertook between February and May, I used a temperature and pH controlled um, Aquaria Laboratory at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science to run a four week experiment where we exposed different shoaling types. So as you can see here on the screen, we had the mixed shoaling type of tropical and temperate uh, affinities. And then we also had the temperate temperate affinity. And we put these under six different treatments. So control being the current summer and current pH here. So 23 degrees and 8.1 pH. And then we also looked at future, um, uh, future winter temperature, and then we also looked at future summer temperature, and then we moved on from this and also looked at how the projected pH for the region might have an interactive effect with the temperature. So to test how these fish were affected by these conditions, we looked at three sort of critical domains to fitness. Um, firstly, we, we use behavioral videos. So we use 12 minute behavioral videos where we place the video outside the tank and we aim to analyze key behaviors like boldness, activity, feeding and brushing, and also foraging over a 12 minute video. Moving from this, following the four weeks exposure, we wanted to look at physiological proxies such as biomarkers for oxidative stress, such as MDA, total protein content, and total antioxidant capacity to see how well the fish were dealing with the conditions at a cellular and also at a tissue level. And then from this, we also wanted to look at how um, CO2 and temperature might have an interactive effect on uh, decision making and behavioural lateralisation. So this might be a simple t-test where we expose the fish to their condition, uh, the treatment, say 26 and 7.7 .7 pH, and then we put them in a, an arena and get them to turn left or right, and then we want to see if they have a bias for turning any particular site. So um, just to see how pH might block this as it's been shown to do this in the past, and whether one fish might have an asymmetry and the other might not, and what this means. So for my second year of data collection, I plan on running uh, field videos along a latitudinal gradient and also collecting tissue samples and running cognitive experiments across a latitudinal gradient, as this has been shown at, to be a good indicator to infer not only how a species respond to temperature, but also how they respond to changes in the um, environment, whether this be the salinity, the phytoplankton composition, or the, just the natural environment, so caring from a coral reef, rocky reef habitat. And so I plan to look at this uh, along, along the east coast of Australia. So looking from the Great Barrier Reef, where the core sort of breeding population of uh, vagrants is, and then moving down along the coast to see where the juveniles at the forefront and at the leading edge of their population are affected by the different interactions and then compare how they vary across the latitudes and then whether there's an interactive effect with the temperates. And so moving on from this, we want to look at how the temperates at lower latitudes where they are solely living by themselves um, differ to the temperates where around Coffs Harbour they interact with the, um, the vagrants and then how this trailing edge behaviour is different from their core sort of range and vice versa how uh, the vagrants at One Tree Island around sort of a coral environment might have their normal predators so they're um, more bold, uh, less bolder Whereas when we move into Coffs Harbour, they lose their sort of no, uh, their predators and there's these novel predators that therefore they're more bolder and then they show different behaviour. So the significance of the research. So understanding the interactions and the ecological implications derived from climate generated range shifts of tropical fish into southeastern Australian uh, marine temperate ecosystems is critical for the understanding and comprehension of future biodiversity and ecological and economic impacts for the region. So past research on rain shifting over in Japan and the east coast of Africa has demonstrated that warming of western boundary currents in those regions uh, generated an influx of tropical organisms which increased the overall biodiversity of the region. However, there was a drop in the biodiversity of temperate uh, organisms within this region. And so there's no um, reason why this won't happen in southeastern Australia. And we want to test this and we want to see how this interaction effect between vagrants and those at the forefront of the range shifting might um, affect, facilitate or mitigate this um, expansion. 
So prospective research will enhance our scientific understanding of climate induced rain shifts in, a num in numerous ways. So firstly, research will assist in discovering how physiological pathways are altered under multi-stressor climate scenarios, revealing stressor interactions at a physiological level on both rain shift vagrants and also on the temperate natives. Secondly, um, the findings will also assist in understanding the indirect and direct links between species physiology and uh, behavioural responses in response to the overall uh, climate shift. So, and finally, this research will help us describe the unique and complex behavioural interactions unique to competing vagrants and temperate fishes and subsequent findings will deliver a unique understanding of species interactions experienced under current conditions what's happening currently and then also aiming to project what might happen in the future under future climatic conditions in order to uncover critical gaps in our understanding of Australian marine rain shifts and also in rain shifts in general. So the key take home messages from my research are that uh, faster than average warming is driving these tropical vagrant fishes south uh, poleward into temperate uh, ecosystems where these vagrants are sort of beginning to compete with the native temperate competitors. We want to understand how these interactions might affect the behavior of one another. And then also given that the, the sort of the climatic premise of the whole region, we want to understand how future climatic conditions might affect these interactions and whereby the vagrants might become the likely dominant competitors if conditions shift to warmer and more acidic. And so this is where my research comes in. So we want to look at the multi-stressor effect on species interactions between invaders and temperates, as it is currently unknown. And this will assist in understanding the underlying drivers of these interactions through behavior, cognition, and lastly, physiological responses. So that brings me to the end of my seminar. Thank you all for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Angus. Thank you. Round of a virtual round of applause. Thank you. I'm intrigued to know um, what risky behaviour in your fish, but um, we will open up. We'll open up the floor for, um, for other questions from anyone else. So please um, share your questions for Angus in the chat line, or um, you know, take the floor. Anybody have a Hi Angus, uh, I'll start off while other people are thinking about the question. <laughs> um, why did you um, select these two specific fish species and how do you think studying them will allow you to extrapolate your findings to similar species, other species? Right. Well, a lot of the vagrants that are coming down are from the damsel fish family, so um, given the uh, the Abadefta vagiensis is the most prominent. It was sort of the most easiest to catch, which made it sort of logistically easier to put them into a laboratory experiment, given the time frame and the cost of running the field experiment. And then also because on that, there's a, there's a paper which shows and demonstrates they were the ones shoaling with um, the strigatus, so the temperate. And so that's sort of some strong evidence where we can put these two together and in order, so if a reviewer comes along, why did you do that? You can sort of use this paper and the other papers and surveys that say that these two sort of show together rather than a paper, uh, rather than a fish that's less common. Does that sort of answer your question? Yep, and then other species, other species. do you think this will be seen in other species too or are these unique responses to these species? Um, well, specifically talking on sort of vagrants. So the other species of damselfish, they're generally quite similar at a juvenile stage. So their morphology, but as they get older, there's um, some evidence to show that their diet sort of changes from being generalist to more specialized as the morphology in their head changes. Um, and so you, I guess you could extrapolate um, across looking at vagrants, um, at a juvenile stage, you could, yes, but as they get older, when they become more specialized, no. Great. Thank you, Angus.
Yes, so any other questions for Angus about his um, the research that he's proposing and mapping out for us? You presented it so well, Angus. It's um it's such a lovely, lovely um study on so many levels and the way that you've mapped that out in terms of your research plan and, and how you've explained that so clearly. I think we can all see that it's a great study and really carefully thought through. So yeah, congratulations. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, big thumbs up from Sean. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so just the last call. No, I think we're all really happy that you know what you're doing and you've um, you're ready to yeah to get out there and do it. So fantastic! Congratulations, and um, we really look forward. Really excited to hear as you go along through the study how that comes along. So we'd love you to come back at the end and and um, share your findings. Awesome! Thank you. You're really welcome. So down the bottom, um, Bo is reminded us, down the bottom of your screens, on the bottom right, you've got a little reaction. So you can um, give Angus a thumbs up or a, a round of applause. Yep, fantastic. Great. So thank you, Angus. And let me share screen. So we will... Move on now to Professor Sean Connell. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we invited um, Professor Sean Connell to kick off this spring series focusing on environmental diversity. And we did that really because um, you know, one of the things that we love about Sean's work is that he's this big picture thinker He's got such a fantastic way of thinking of, of the big picture, global question, the mechanism underneath what's going on and linking that to real world outcomes. So as you can see, some of the work that, that Sean and his team is doing at the moment is around restoration um, along uh, oyster reefs, along the South Australian coast, but also thinking about these questions and the global implications of them. So we've asked Sean to open and um, share his thoughts on environmental diversity. What does that mean? Why does it matter? Sean, over to you. Great, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep, fantastic. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's quite a task and an honor to uh, present to you on this topic. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is why I think humanity's future relies on natural diversity. Uh, the school of thought I came from as a, from a graduate student was everything was seen through the eyes of a null hypothesis and for those people who thought biodiversity was important you really needed to know what you're talking about or you'd be shot down. We've made a substantial amount of progress since then and I want to talk to you about um, why I think diversity is important through the lens of being a marine biologist here in South Australia and uh, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey starting off with two papers that captured my attention over the last five years. First is this one by Isabel where uh, what that group did, a very large number of authors, show that in these grassland experiments, which are huge, that as you increase biodiversity, you increase an ecosystem function, in this case productivity, and its resistance to climate shocks. Uh, if you look at both these components of stabilisation, uh, it is the resistance component which is the greatest. Whilst you get a small amount of resilience, this ability of diversity to stabilize against these sh shocks is quite interesting. So there's something about diversity in here which is uh, captured in my imagination. The other one here that I uh, was struck by is this paper in Science by Hatton, which showed that when you think about production and its relationship to consumers, there's this extraordinary regularity in not just the function but also the structure that transcends the land, the sea, and even freshwater systems. It was a global analysis. 
And uh, you can just see here that primary production relates very well to consumption across these quite different systems. And yet, when you speak to one of the authors, they say, well, we don't actually understand the similarity. So if we just flip back, you speak to uh, Michelle Rowe, who is part of this, this experiment here, he says, but we don't know what the mechanisms are. So there's something going on in the way that our systems are ordered, evolutionary, ecologically, physiologically, down to their cells, which allows them to be able to survive some kind of shocks. Out of this, the systems that we're studying aren't random subsets of assemblages that just happen to co-occur because they have a shared history through time or a shared physiological constraints that they just have hazard assemblages. There's something more than that, that potentially a community where there's a lot more order in it than we think. And that's where I think diversity might be an important component. Why is this important? Well, I think if you're thinking about consumption and production from a natural perspective, and human humanity is relying on consumption, in this case, this is energy consumption, what we're looking for into the future are these countries here catching up with what we call the first world. Now, if you look at this in terms of our meat consumption, and this is a very interesting website because what it does is it goes back 10, 15 years and shows how these countries are moving along this axis here. So the amount of money being earned per person has been increasing through time and their meat consumption is increasing through time. Now, meat is an incredibly expensive, energy consumptive thing to be able to produce. And the world is relying more and more on productivity, which must come from primary productivity through here to tertiary productivity. So productivity needs to increase across a number of trophic levels for us to actually sustain life on our planet. It's not just consumption that we're concerned about, it's also we're concerned about the quality of our lives. We know that mental health is becoming a number one um, issue, health issue around the world, and that the quality of the spaces that we inhabit, our green spaces, our blue spaces, make a difference to our mental health. And uh, World Health Organization have put out this uh, report here saying that mental disorders affect one in four people. That's a, that's a large number of people. And this is set to continue into the future. So in the news recently, uh, and I, this is worth reading word for word from the UN, that increasing consumption, environmental degradation, and climate change are placing significant and potentially unsustainable pressure on the availability and usability, love that they recognize its usability of natural resources, such as land, water, and ecosystems. So we are facing serious changes in which uh, the outcomes can be uh, leading to uh, a reduction in quality and quantity of resources that lead to conflict. And through human history, there, we are littered where human con conflict has occurred because of fights over limited resources. And of course, that has to be too awake to recognize that uh, the pandemic that we're under is, uh, there's been great concern that that's something to do with the natural environment suffering that's causing uh, what we're currently experiencing. So, so what does diversity do? Well, what is Sean going to do to connect these global events and this uncertain future that we're wandering into to diversity? Well, I'm going to start here from South Australia and talk about uh, some of the things that I've and Mabel Kirk and his group, my group, have been doing, where what we're finding through a number of papers is that we get this transition from today to the future, these are a large number of experiments done under a lot of different conditions, in which we get this collapse where there looks to be a lower production of secondary consumers, fish here, less diversity production of primary consumers, and the base of our food webs has been eroded to the extent that we're actually seeing uh, these weedy, in this case, it, in the marine systems, and look, the turf forming, fast growing opportunistic algae taking over. In my system here in South Australia, what that is is the loss of kelp forests and its replacement by turf species. Little tiny filamentous algae that carpets the bottom 
And if we look at this uh, couple of stresses here that causes this, uh, let's look at ocean acidification. So you can see these two boys here, they're, they're not the people that wrote the science paper. Uh, the acidification erodes the ability for uh, the, your teeth to calcify. These guys here, the snail, the amphipods, etc., are calcifiers and they have, have a direct effect on their ability to sustain their populations into the future. Uh, quite a few years ago, uh, we recognized that, that as carbon dioxide is taken up into the atmosphere and acidifies the oceans, it is also it comes with a fertilization effect. And it wasn't all negative, that there could be some positives with this fertilization effect. And in exploring that fertilization effect, what we found is, was that these weedy species were the ones which actually uh, got a competitive advantage over the more long-lived species. So that contributes, both those contributes to this triangle and the rate at which we would anticipate collapse. So I'm turning to diversity now, and that's the diversity of consumers. Let's just take two consumers and see what they do to potentially stabilize against this change. So if I go for a dive at Wakari Island uh, in New Zealand, where there's these volcanic vents that uh, are enriching the ocean with um, CO2 bubbles. We indeed find more of these perth forming algae. So that's a relief for an, as an experimenter. Um, if you can't find your experimental outcomes under natural conditions, you'll be quite concerned. So it's quite nice to know that around the world, these kind of vents create these experimental conditions of more turf forming algae. And these algae have uh, these calcifiers, these gastropods, which consume more algae. But can they consume and to the extent they can actually create some sort of stability in which that algae doesn't take over? And what I'm going to do here is explore the gross productivity. This is control, this is the future. And you can see here without any consumers, growth of these algae increases almost twofold. What happens if we put the snails into the system? What we find in experimental systems is that they balance out productivity. There's no difference here between the controls in the future here. If we put those snails together with those amphipods, we find the same effect. If then we take out the snail and we just focus on the amphipods, we get the same effect. Now, it's only two species here. The diversity is extremely low. You can't go much lower than that. But isn't that extraordinary? That at that level, you can have them working together to actually stabilize productivity. And what's happening here is that as the conditions, environmental conditions, increase from low stress to high stress with multiple factors creating this increase in turf growth, you get an increase in compensatory response, which is this feeding by the snails. It was quite a discovery in which led us to think about uh, the sorts of theories that don't take into account that when we're talking about ecosystem stability. And our idea is that as you come at an ecosystem with some force, that ecosystem is able to push back through compensatory dynamics. As you increase that force, it can push back at increasing amounts so that it can stabilize the system. The more we look at this, the more we find evidence for it. But we also find that nature can be quite brutal because we can drive those compensatory dynamics down sufficiently that we can create ecosystem collapse. But before collapse, we do have something like this, where the performance of our producers and consumers may actually be relatively evenly matched so that systems are perpetually flip, flipping and changing but are stabilized through time through small and relatively large shocks. And of course, we can create the circumstance where the system collapses. This is a case here where we're just looking at heat waves and, and warming. The system seems to compensate, compensate, and beyond a particular threshold, it rapidly collapses. And um, this is a paper um, with Ivan, um, two PhD students, three PhD students, Sylvan Goldenberg, Camilo, um, Harriet and myself, and uh, one of the key things here is that uh, we see a strengthening um, of uh, this producer-consumer relationship under acidification, combine that with warming, um, and these actually tend to collapse. 
and in this paper uh, that we published a couple of weeks ago, uh, we find that uh, we get this hollowing out here, which we think leads to what would be a collapse where this bottom part of the pyramid is uh, more dominated by um, the faster growing media species. So what um, I'm saying here is that uh, the, there's a large number of species that contribute to what is a complex trophic system that, whoops, sorry guys, that uh, holds it together up to a particular point beyond which we can push it to create collapse. And this particular graphic here is based on a South Australian system. So you can imagine if herbivores are important to these systems, putting in place, say, marine protected areas or management which actually reduces the, uh, the negative effects on herbivores, you might be able to maintain those functions. Now, each time we look at a different species, we're surprised by how much uh, it contributes to those functions. We can't, we don't have time at the rate that warming and, and acidification is occurring to understand what each of those species is contributing. Amongst that diversity are a diversity of responses. And so it's almost like an insurance policy to actually have as many species as we have. It's a bit like an aeroplane where an aeroplane is largely held together by rivets. They're an aluminium structured um, vehicle. And you could probably lose quite a few rivets and your plane can keep flying. Some rivets will be more important than others. Uh, but at the end of the day, you want most of those rivets on your plane. You want most of those species in your system if it's going to travel along with us and take humanity with us into the future where we're going to be more and more relying on our quality of lives because of the productivity of the systems in which we're actually dependent. What I'm switching to now is restoring systems. So I've been talking about managing systems that exist today and maintaining them. What about bringing back systems? And I'm going to talk about systems coming back from functional extinction. Love this picture of uh, the deserts in the Northern Hemisphere, where we recognized that years ago, they were actually productive rainforests. The system I'm going to talk about is from South Australia, where we used to have oyster reefs, which have now been uh, taken out, and they're just large tracts of sand, from very productive, diverse systems to low productive and, uh, and not quite so diverse systems. Well, what we see um, in a lot of the projects that restore is they tend to focus on the focal species and create these monocultures. And this is no different for oyster systems. This work I'm doing here is with Don McAfee um, and uh, Brittany, who's uh, really hard at work in trying to understand how we can bring these systems back. So we know that if diversity allows these systems stability, then perhaps diversity might be key to actually bring these systems back quicker and stabilize them. The system I'm talking about, Adelaide's just here. This is Kangaroo Island. Uh, these gulfs here, this is our local gulf, were oyster beds. And years ago, uh, they tried to save them from uh, basic extinction which, they are, extinction, which they are today. They're functionally extinct and failed. So if you go back to the starving South Australians that first arrived here on the promise of food, not finding it, having to eat oysters, which are about the size of uh, a dinner plate um, and crayfish. We think they're delicacies, but back then they complained about having to eat those creatures. Uh, they moved to uh, taking them out. You can see these um, implements here, removing them. And at such a rate that the very first legislation um, in South Australia had to be passed through the Houses of Parliament in England um, to introduce this permit for being able to lay down um, oyster beds to try and bring back this productivity that we're losing. Uh, and then there's legislation to prevent um, its destruction. And then not so many years later, um, the inspector recommended all further dredging. These are the covers that were being used to dredge uh, be suspended. And then the turn of the century, we had this failure. And now we have no one in, working really in that industry. Our oyster beds, which are a bit like the corals of the greatest, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, um, have been removed. They're gone. They're functionally extinct. It's sand. 
it's no longer a productive oyster reef. So uh, we wrote a paper, um, took it to government, and uh, this is with Heidi Alloy, and um, the government thought, wow, this is not a bad idea to bring back productivity and jobs back to South Australia. Uh, without that production and that productivity and diversity, uh, what we'll have is wandering into the future with bare sand. So we've built this reef of over about 1.1 kilometre of coast. Uh, it's a major engineering project um, on the idea that it's going to bring back productivity and, uh, of course, the recreational fishes um, and the folk around uh, the coast are very excited by that. And this is the team. Uh, this is Dom here. And uh, this is the, the dive boat that we use to service that reef. One of the big problems that we're facing, and I think this is a diversity issue, is that these turf algae that I was referring to, that last paper, um, the science paper, have taken over these reefs. And if you look at the number of oysters on the top of the reefs, they're very few relative to the oyster recruitment that we're getting on the bottom of these rocks. So oyster recruitment is extraordinary. We did a lot of research trying to locate these reefs in the right area to get the oysters to come back. Yes, we got that right, but what we got wrong was that we didn't anticipate that uh, recruitment would be so poor on the upper surfaces where they need to land and feed. They're a filter feeder. They need access to the um, open water. So this really was a great concern and a little bit of lost sleep. If you're um, working on a project like this, which you've convinced state government that it's worth investing a couple of million, along with the federal government, a few more million to um, improve people's lives and you can have this outcome, you do lose some sleep. Uh, this is a, a great paper um, led by Don McAfee um, and Catherine Larkin in which um, we show that diversity is important. It's, we think that a multi-species restoration approach is the way to go. And this graphic by Dom shows that uh, if you just look at oysters alone, uh, we have the system where this algae covers the, the, uh, the reef and it doesn't matter really how much, how much spat you've got, how much recruits you've got, you've got a fairly poor system in terms of recovery. Add and kelp, and we get this boost to recruitment. The kelp removes the interaction with the turfs, it suppresses the turfs and allows the oysters to come back. So just by adding one species again, one species, we knew a lot about the ecology of the species, we thought it would be the ideal one to suppress turfs, we are able to boost recruitment. Incidentally, while we were doing this, at another university in Tasmania, they were doing a separate experiment, not on oysters, but on kelp. So they were testing a hypothesis about um, kelp dynamics. And they set up these reefs um, in a sandy bay. Remember, our reefs are in sandy bay. They tied down kelp. They created reefs like this. And what do you think they got? They got oysters. And they, they, don't, have, they don't have reefs of oysters down there, but they created reefs of these native oysters. That's extraordinary makes us think that um, perhaps if you go back in time, a large part of the Australian um, coastal ecology was, yes, oysters, but also in conjunction with a diversity of other things, particularly kelp. And this photograph is from the last natural remaining oyster reef in Australia, uh, George's Bay, which I'm sorry to say is currently being fished for oysters. And uh, you notice here that there is a diversity of kelps. What's important about this research um, is that it's giving our government confidence to put out another oyster reef. So this is our uh, minister uh, of the environment. Um, this little box here is showing where we're putting out our next reef. And if you read this, new shellfish reef to be built at Glenelg, South Australia will have its first metropolitan native shellfish at Glenelg. Uh, it's gonna cost about 1.2 million to boost fish numbers and create jobs. So you can see the, the uh, effect here for the minister is that he wants to know we've got a success. He wants to know that it's going to boost productivity and that productivity inevitably lead up to creation of jobs. This had us thinking about what it is that we're doing as biologists to make sure that we are equipping our government with the political firepower 
to bring back diversity, to bring back uh, restoration, because it's a very risky process. And this paper, um, led by Dom and Heidi Alloway, who was uh, the person who helped me um, understand what life was like back 200 years ago with those Lister reefs. It was quite an amazing story um, about um, how we learned that they were even there. But what I'm, what I'm underlying here is that the decision-making process in, in, in the uh, conservation space is very political. And it does involve decisions with uncertain outcomes, I've lost sleep over it, with stakeholders with conflicting viewpoints, strongly conflicting viewpoints. So if we're going to empower our government, we need a process that allows there to be some alignment between the government, industry and public that can reconcile those viewpoints so that we can underpin the legitimacy of these decisions. And so uh, the research that uh, we're doing here in South Australia, the research that you're doing in your honours and your PhD, um, work around aspects of diversity that can underpin the mechanisms that can provide the confidence that we can take to our politicians to argue for conservation or restoration, I think is really quite critical. And incidentally, I think we need to have more people working in this space who can't just sit in our offices and our labs and produce good science. I don't think that's good enough if we're going to be citizens in that, on this planet to actually help us wander into this uncertain future where we're all expecting to have better quality lives for ourselves and our next generation. So this is my last slide. Um, what I'm arguing um, through the lens of uh, my face mask is that diversity holds our future. We are reliant. It's not just these countries up here, United States, Australia, uh, which are the wealthy countries which are able to pay ourselves handsomely and eat fabulously. The rest of the world would like to catch up with this and they are catching up with us. And we will continue to want to earn more and eat better. That's gonna place enormous demands on our planet. Uh, our mental health is at risk. Uh, the kinds of issues that we're facing at the moment, I don't wanna get into it, are substantial and they look to intensify. So by having diverse systems that provide the mechanisms by which our consumption, which is going to increase our mental well-being, which is becoming more brittle, diversity holds that future. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for um, thought-provoking, as always. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so much to think about. <laughs> Thank you, and, and just the, um, the, 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 the breadth as well as, as the depth of that. Um, yeah, particularly around productivity, um, helping me to think about our systems, and yeah, I've certainly got some questions for you around that. Um, but first of all, let me open the floor to, um, to everybody, whether anybody else has um, questions, many questions, I'm sure, for Sean on his thoughts around diversity and restoring diversity, particularly. Oh, now I have a question for you while the others are thinking. <laughs> um, so great talk, excellent. Um, I was just wondering, you're talking about a compensatory effect by herbivores to um, increases in elbow turf and other primary producers. So that compensatory effect, is that at the individual levels, for example, through increased herbivory, or is that through population level? So simply more herbivores before, um, because the carrying capacity of the system increases? Or is it at community level through species replacement where maybe herbivores that are able to, to eat more or, or have a wider diet replace let's say, uh, more selective species. And how is that then related to your biodiversity question? Will biodiversity then increase the uh, herbivory uh, pressure um, under those compensatory processes? I think what struck me is the extraordinary flexibility of natural systems uh, to reshuffle themselves around change. Just take your first two examples as an individual or population-based. 
uh, in that graphic I showed you with just the two species, one was, was responding because it was upping its rate of consumption as a behavioral effect. The other species was upping its reproductive output, so its populations would increase. So one was a population response, one was a uh, individual response, uh, both happening over very quick periods of time. Uh, of course, behavior is instantaneous virtually. Uh, and then as we ramp up to more complex um, assemblages, uh, species pools, uh, when you're talking about functional redundancy, my sense is that if we don't understand which species uh, the rivets on our plane that we're flying into this future, uh, we can't afford to assume all rivets are equal and that we will need to manage them uh, as, as a collective, as a whole. Uh, I imagine every time a Qantas uh, engineer goes around the aeroplane, they're very careful to make sure that every rivet's in place. Um, and I suspect that diversity of rivets is the way that we ought to be thinking about our species and our, and our system. Uh, I, I tend to think that um, these interplay from that behavioral perspective through to the population and community perspective goes much beyond, more than, broader than that. The adaptability of natural systems probably happens at ecosystem scales that we haven't probably thought through. Um, and, I will, and I know I will admit this, that we've actually witnessed these things at atomic scales. And we think they probably scale up from atoms through to the cells, through to the individual's physiology on the way up. And it's a big task to put all that together, uh, but it is heartening to see this being played across a multitude of scales. Right, so do you think time, time could be related to this? So there'll be responses at individual level are the immediate responses you see. And then as you look over it over longer periods, you, you see population responses emerge. And then even over longer time, you see community responses and even longer time or maybe genetic response. Could, could, could time be a very strong axis that explains this upscaling from individual to, to community levels? Well, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I think so. Uh... I think the next experiments need to be done that are intergenerational. <laughs> good, thanks, Sean. I'll leave it to the others now. <laughs> uh, I, I love your X axis. It's a good one. I just need another career to start all over again and run these experiments for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Okay, so we have um, time for one last question um, from Sean before we look on to what's coming next, next month. So one last question. Can I ask? Yeah, please. I have a very simple question actually. So um, in terms of replacing, what's the mechanism between the um, help taking over uh, the the places that turn into oyster reefs, basically. Is it just really fast growing or is it like a competition for space? Um, just wondering what, what uh, or why the other populations basically decrease when it comes into the scene. Um, uh, um, I think the best thing I think what um, you asked is, uh, what is the mechanism by which uh, the boosting of the recruitment of oysters is happening? Um, and uh, what happens is these weedy species carp at the bottom like a mat and the mat traps sediment which prohibits the recruitment of little creatures like uh, the, uh, the spat that the life history stages of the oysters from being able to find a place to glue onto their rock and what the cult does is it not only shades and prevents the um, uh, the growth, the fast growth of these weedy species, but it also scours um, and it creates that beautiful bare rock that the oysters are able to settle onto. As calcifiers, then they have this protection against that scour and they're able to grow. And for some reason, looking at Tasmania, they grow really well. So they might be scoured by kelp, but they can still filter feed. Uh, and so there's something really interesting between the linkages between those two that probably facilitates both ways 
maybe not just the kelp facilitating the oysters, but also the oysters being able to facilitate the kelp, which makes us think that we're not when we're no longer studying natural systems anywhere um, where these species would have co-occurred. We're just studying the remnants of what used to be there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sean, are you able to stay on if people have um, more questions? Do you have to stay on for a little longer? Sure. Yep, fantastic. That would be great. Thank you. So, um, thank you again. Just a very big thank you again to Angus and to Sean for um, sharing your research today and your, your looking forward. So, next month in our spring series, we have on 2nd of October, Friday the 2nd of October, we are taking a marine theme again around diversity. So we'd love you to join us to hear from Viniri and Sophie on their research. So again, two new PhD students um, who are going to be mapping out their exciting research around um, plastics and pollution in our oceans. So we really hope that you can join us for that. So thank you everyone for joining us. Hope you have a great month and we'll see you again. Same time, same place on Zoom, um, Friday the 2nd of October. Great, thank you. But if you've got questions, you're welcome to stay for a bit longer with Sean and Angus. Great, see you all, thank you. <laughs>